Our last talk of the afternoon is going to be presented by Dr. Randy Gregg, who is uh, a member of the faculty here at VCOM. He's the Associate Professor and Discipline Chair of our Microbiology, Immunology, and Virology Discipline. And uh, he has a, a history working in, in cancer biology and cancer area. He's looked at the relationship between the cytokine, and ve cytokine environment and the outcome of pancreatic adenocarcinoma growth. So that relates to the talk we had earlier about how environment really can, can affect the situation. And that work, I think, led him to develop this novel cancer vaccine idea that he can uh, target vaccines to abnormal cells that are expressing certain cancer factors. I don't know if you want me to tell or not. It's in your talk, I suppose. But the idea that you can pick out these particular cancer determinants and you can develop a vaccine against them to try to get an immunological response against these cancer cells and try to knock them down as a part of trying to help control the overall situation. So now we'll let Dr. Greg describe this work, and I'll turn the podium over to you. Thank you. All righty. So um, I'm going to actually follow Dr. Welch's uh, approach in terms of my presentation. You know, I have a lot of cartoons, I'm going to tell a little story, and uh, add, sprinkle a little bit of data in there so I don't overwhelm you late in the afternoon with lots of uh, figures and so forth. But uh, I really want to get at this question, this notion of uh, cancer immunotherapy and its niche in oncology. I know that's been a question uh, for a number of years now. And the first thing I want to do is first uh, is just identify what actually cancer immunotherapy is. And it really is the notion of stimulating the immune response or modulating the response in some fashion to be able to generate a really nice, strong response to eradicate the tumor. Well, that's the, the end goal, the hope. Um, and so we'll, we'll examine some of these things to try to figure out if, if uh, actually it is indeed doing that. And so uh, in terms of trying to get at this question, I actually uh, wanted to approach it in the terms of looking at the stages of oncogenesis and, and really address it more from a, histologic, uh, a historical, not histological, historical approach in terms of the work that's been done over the years identifying this, this nice interplay between cancer cells and the immune system. And what we learn from that, can we apply that to uh, cancer immunotherapy? So we'll start with looking at really the anti-cancer immune response. And of course, there's been a lot of talk so far about how we get a cancer in terms of genetic anomalies that occur. You get this uh, unchecked replication and then formation of this bundle of cells, which then can become metastatic in some cases. The nice thing was identified in the early 80s, uh, there is some type of response that develops from the host. Uh, and so you got this defensive mechanism that is actually turned on by sensors to this abnormality. And so we're going to look at the mechanisms underlying that. And really the two major components I want to focus uh, on and actually focus more on one would be this notion of something called humoral immunity and cell immunity, uh, cell mediated immunity. So these are the two types of main responses you're going to get uh, against viruses, pathogens, and cancers as well. The first one here deals with a cell population called B cells, and they produce things like antibodies. These are proteins that can bind to targets and then help facilitate killing of those targets. And then cell mediated really involves a population called T cells, and these mainly develop the ability to kill directly. Okay? And so the focus of the talk really is going to kind of ignore the humoral immune uh, uh, portion of this, mainly because it would take about another hour to talk about those guys. Uh, so we'll focus uh, in the next few minutes about the CMI, the cell-mediated immune response in T cells. Okay? So I'm going to take you through, using some cartoons, sort of what the immune response is when you start to develop a cancer and then kind of work from there. So I'm going to use uh, melanoma as the model system here. And so we have some tumors developing, uh, basically melanocytes that have uncontrolled or unchecked replication. You can see here's the skin. We got the outer layer. We got uh, the epidermis and then the deeper tissue, which is the dermis, and then some blood vessels that are running through the skin. And you can see there's a number of cells that you normally encounter there. There's something called a dendritic cell. There's something called macrophages. And in the blood, there's these things called monocytes and neutrophils and natural killer cells. So there's a lot of different types of cells around. And we're going to talk about each one and how they, they contribute. And so the first thing that happens is there's a sensing that there's something wrong. And so epithelial cells, which are really all in this tissue, as well as macrophages can sense the danger, can sense there's a problem, and they'll start producing compounds called chemokines and cytokines. 
The chemokines are kind of like breadcrumbs. Uh, essentially, they're pheromones, those types of attractants that bring cells to the source. And then cytokines are more modulating type things. They stimulate some things, they turn things off, they sort of modulate the overall response. So these two things have one function, and that's really to signal, hey, there's a, there's a problem here. So it's a red alert issue. And the red alert really relates to looking at the cell surface of these individually endothelial cells. So this is a blood vessel, and so it's got these endothelial cells that wrap around it. And in the lumen, or at least where the blood is flowing, you're going to have expression of these homing molecules. And that's what's going to be the alert signal. Essentially, cells that are flowing through the blood will attach to those homing signals. And, and then we talked about how cells move through the endothelial tissue by squeezing in between. Same thing happens here. Those immune cells, mainly uh, neutrophils and NK cells and monocytes, can slide through. And then they'll follow that breadcrumb uh, trail all the way back to the source, which should lead them to the area near the tumor, at least in the tumor. Okay. And at that point, <clears throat> some of the cytokines that have been produced can cause conversions to occur. So these monocytes can develop into more macrophages, and the macrophages are nice because they are like killer cells, so they can help degrade the tumor. And so you put all this together, the neutrophils, the NKs, the macrophages, they start producing lots of killing molecules, toxins and enzymes and cytolytic molecules. And so all that together pounds the tumor. Okay. This is collectively called the innate immune response. So this is, there's no specificity here. You're just attacking something that's not right. Okay. So that situation continues. Sometimes the tumor can be eradicated. In most cases, it's probably not going to. So there's a backup system in place. That's where these dendritic cells come in. These are the great garbage collectors of the body. So they're able to take up any debris that's been liberated by killing. So the macrophage and Ks and so forth have killed these tumors. They've liberated debris. And the debris here are just various components, lipids and proteins and things of the cell. So the DCs pick that up. And then they're going to take that on back to the lymph nodes. Okay? And so this lymphatic vessel is simply uh, throughout your body, you have these lymphatics, which drain the tissues. So the blood circulates through, squeezes a little plasma into the tissue. That allows transfer of nutrients in the tissue, bathes the tissue, and you continually do that as your heart pumps, but you could fill the tissue with too much fluid, so there has to be a drainage system, and that's the lymphatics. So they drain the tissues, the material goes back into the lymph, lymph nodes, which then gets filtered for any pathogens or nasties or anything like that, and then it's returned to the blood, so you recirculate that back. So DCs make use of that system. And here, we're going to go to the lymph node now. And so here's our DC. It's picked up our, our proteins. It's on its way back to the uh, draining lymph node. And so in the process, it's breaking down those proteins into individually small pieces we call peptides. And something else interesting is happening. You can see if I slip back, it's changed shape. See how it went from this? I changed color too. But you see how it's changed from this sort of round guy and now this, all these uh, extensions out there? This is called maturation. And so what happens, and it's a very important process, if the DC gets activated by some pathogen or a cancer, it causes it to change and express these molecules called the MHC. And in the process of tearing apart these different components, it loads those components onto the MHC. So this is kind of like a display molecule. It's just like taking a piece of candy and showing it to a child, and a child comes running towards you. Okay? So that's really what the dendritic cells are going to do. They're going to take this antigen, so we're going to call this antigen now, these little peptides, we're going to display it out here, and our kids are going to be the T cells. The little children are going to be our T cells. They're going to come running up. They're going to take a, take a lick or a smell of the candy. If they like it, they get excited and replicate. If they don't, then they simply ignore it, and the dendritic cell goes to the next T cell. Once it finds the T cell that recognizes that antigen, you're going to have an explosion of replication. So you're going to create this uh, clone uh, number of cells, in essence, a clone army. And this clone army, as you see, they have little guns here. So they're going to have weapons. So stormtroopers are no good unless they have a laser gun, right? So they're equipped with what they need, but they're not going to do any good here in the lymph node. So they need to find a way back 
to the tumor site. And so one of the other nice things about activation is they acquire those same molecules to bind to those homing features we found in the endothelia. So that's going to allow them to go back through the blood, attach to this, this, uh, this site that has these homing molecules, slide into the tissue, and then they can start using their weaponry to kill the uh, tumor. So if it's successful, then you have spontaneous regression. Tumor goes away. You've killed it. Great job. However, in most cases, tumor stays. Okay? And so it's a great riddle trying to understand how this tumor escapes such a sophisticated and specific system uh, that allows it to control the growth. So how does it work? So to start looking at and trying to answer this question and get back to our cancer immunotherapy and how we can use this information to help in treatments, we have to focus in on these anti-tumor T cells. What's happening here? And so the focus really is going to be looking at how it senses the antigen. And through a number of different studies, it was found if you looked at this T cell receptor, this is the thing that actually sees the antigen. I uh, picture it's like somebody like myself who's nearsighted. I can see there's people there, but I could not make out who it is, right? I'm blind as a bat. So the same thing with the T cells, these anti-tumor T cells, they're nearsighted. They can see the antigen, but they don't respond very well to it. So what in essence happens, you don't get a nice robust T cell response, you get a moderate response. And, what, and so that's going to lead us to our next stage of oncogenesis in terms of looking at this cancer growth and immune response equilibrium in the sense that cancer is going to win here, mainly due to the fact you get very few T cells. They can kill, but it's slow killing. And you end up with a population of fairly resistant cells whatever we identify that resistance to be, whether it's genetic or it's some other mechanism. And then those cells are able to replicate beyond the capacity of the T cells to control them. And now you have what's called tumor escape, and the tumor wins. Okay. So the first goal of cancer immunotherapy, based on what we've learned, we need to generate a really good T cell response. It needs to be better than what you can normally do. And so one of the first approaches well, actually, so this would be the idea. It's going to have enough T cells to be able to eradicate the tumor, or at least beat it down to the point to where you're going to increase the patient's survival. So that's sort of the notion behind it. One of the first approaches to trying to uh, fulfill this first goal was simply taking T cells, uh, multiplying those T cells, and then transferring them into patients. This is some work I did while I was at UVA back when people were starting to do this. Uh, and there's still tinkering around with this notion. Here we have a, a mouse system. I'll show some human data here in a second. So I have a, a melanoma cell line um, derived from a C57 black 6 mouse. You inject it just under the skin. It's a transplantable model. You wait about seven or eight days when the tumor starts forming. Uh, and then I inject the T cells. And so these T cells are, are uh, devised against the tumor so they can recognize tumor antigens. And then we support that injection with some sort of growth factor. And here I used IL-2. So that's interleukin-2. It's a cytokine. It helps the T cells survive, grow, expand, do the thing they need. And then I follow up with a few more injections of IL-2 and then use this little machine to, to measure the sizes of the tumors. Okay? And so here's what the data would look like for something like that. Uh, first of all, the T cells that I used are a specific brand or flavor, if you will. They're called CD8. That's your killer cells, as uh, mentioned a few moments ago. The CD8 T cells, that just means it has a protein on its surface called CD8, and that's how you identify them. But they have the ability to kill tumors directly. Okay? So once they're activ activated, they can go recognize a tumor and lyse it. So this is what we transferred into the animals. And if we go to the figure, what it's showing here is something called tumor outgrowth. That means once you've reached the point of tumor outgrowth, the tumor's gotten so large that it's fairly lethal or it's life-threatening to the animal, and we simply sacrifice them to be you know, uh, humane about it. So there's a certain point in which we allow them to grow. So once they've reached outgrowth, essentially they're sacrificed, and the animal's considered to, to have not, not survived the, the cancer. And so you can see with no T cells transferred, the, the groups, the control groups here, even with cytokine, simply uh, have tumor outgrowth and the survival is zero there. But when we added T cells, pretty substantial delay in the outgrowth of the tumors. And again, at each point here, we're talking about percentages of animals. And we have an N of 10 in each group. So those percentages per uh, grouping. 
And even at the end of the clinical observation in the group that had the cytokine along with the T cells, we had 20% or at least two of the 10 animals that didn't have outgrown tumors. Either they had stable disease where the tumor is not growing or they simply were, the tumor was getting uh, larger very slowly over time. Okay? So it definitely has an impact. Now how does this relate to, the t to a human system? So I pulled this study out from a most recent study using a CD8 T cell transfer, very similar to what we did with the animals. Patient has a, a tumor, pull out the CD8s, culture them with some cytokine, the IL-2 is what they use, and then transfer them back in. Again, the idea here is to make a large bolus, a large number of these T cells, and transfer them in. This is the protocol they followed. Essentially, they're going to transfer the T cells in at four different points, and then follow that with cytokine. So I hope that kind of makes sense. And boy, there's a lot of data here. Essentially, it's a, a group of 10 individuals they used in this study. Uh, this is the number of T cell infusions. So there's a couple of variations there. But in essence, they did four infusions with three followed in cytokine. This is a metastatic uh, melanoma system, or basically patients who had metastatic melanoma is what they're treating for. And essentially, eight of the 10 individuals had at least a stable disease or some type of tumor reduction after the transfer. So pretty successful with a nice uh, duration of uh, sta uh, stable disease over about 11 to 12 months. Okay? So it suggests that it actually does have some significance. Now outside of just taking a bolus of T cells and shoving them in the patients, another good approach might be, well, instead of doing that, it's more feasible if we expand the cells that are already in the patient. So the other approach is to use dendritic cells as the manipulator of the T cell population. And so here you pull out dendritic cells from the patient, you give them some really strong stimuli to make them mature, remember that allows them to get those dis display molecules and present antigen to the T cells. Give them some antigen and dump them back into the patient. And so this uh, figure here I derived from uh, seven or eight different, actually seven different studies, so I put them all together. I simplified it in terms of the cytokines they use to culture these dendritic cells, so there's various combinations that you can use to mature them. Okay, so I just simplified it. And then the doses are different, and these are the different number of patients. And so you can see roughly, except for one study, about 30 to 50 percent uh, had a positive response, which means they had regression, complete regression. They had stable disease. There was no growth, but there was no reduction, but that's not a bad uh, clinical situation. Uh, or they had some uh, reduction, some uh, slight reduction in the tumor. So again, Pretty good approach, and this time you're not using this bolus of cells along with cytokine. You're simply putting in dendritic cells. So these are some of, sort of the first approaches. Since then, there have been a number of other approaches, just simply using cytokines and dumping those into patients. There's some toxicity issues uh, related with that, uh, liver things, fevers, rashes. You can stimulate the dendritic cells directly by using things called adjuvants. These are just compounds that facilitate maturation. Again, some of those might have some toxicity. And then blocking agents. So you can actually add things in that block the tumor effects uh, on the dendritic cells. So again, it would take another 30 minutes to talk about these different areas. But uh, put it all together, these approaches all together still fail to eradicate the tumor. So we're left asking the question, what is the issue here? Why is it that this first goal, if we meet it, it's still not sufficient to eradicate the tumor. That leads us to our fourth stage of oncogenesis, which looks now at these cells that, reside, that remain after the first wave of the immune response. So what's happening? So if you take a close look at these persistent cancer cells, you find that they're actually producing inhibitory type proteins or cytokines. They're producing things that shut down the immune response. And not only that, they're promoting and recruiting cells that can do the same thing. So you have a protein being produced that does it, and now you're recruiting cells that can also support uh, inhibition of the immune response against the tumor. So again, facilitates tumor escape. And this is actually one of the things that tumor immunologists now are recognizing as probably the main driving force behind the fact you can't eradicate the tumor with cancer immunotherapy. And from a number of studies, uh, some of it coming out of Moffitt actually, you found two populations of regulatory cells that seem to be recruited by tumors explicitly. It's a population called T-regulatory and myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Okay? Now they have their own identifying markers on the surface. Again, these are just proteins that you can identify them. They produce 
mainly these two types of cytokines, that's uh, transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta and IL-10. Both of those have the ability to suppress T cell killing, natural killer cell killing. They prevent maturation of DCs. They can promote macrophages to help build blood vessels so the tumor can grow. And they also eliminate uh, nutrients that would help the T cells to survive in the tumor tissue or even in the spleen and lymph node. And these things actually spread away from the tumor site. You find them in and around the tumor, but they can also infiltrate the spleen and the lymph nodes and shut down the immune response at the source. So they're a real problem, okay? So this is what we envision in terms of what's happening uh, at the tumor site as well as at the site where you're going to be activating T cells, which would really be the lymph nodes. You're going to have this environment that's rich in these cytokines. The GMCSF here, you don't need to know the name, but essentially this is going to be the uh, expansion factor for your MDSCs, okay? So that's not going to help. VGF is going to promote the, the angiogenesis or the blood vessel formation. And then we talked about the role of these two. So if you took a snapshot, you'd see lots of tumor, lots of regulatory cells, lots of an immature DCs. They've got antigen, but they can't do anything with it. Uh, and these macrophages producing IL-10 and promoting blood vessel formation. So it's not a really nice, formidable environment or nice environment that's going to uh, support T cell functions against tumor. So again, the second goal now of cancer immunotherapy would be counteract the activity of these nasty regulatory cells. And so uh, again, some of the work at Moffitt and other places have identified agents that can function to reduce the numbers of these cells, both of them or one or the other, inhibit their functions. And most importantly, this seems to be the one that kind of comes out uh, with most robust activity is prevent the generation of these, mainly through blocking TGF beta functions as well as uh, inducing IL-12, which we saw a while ago. IL-12 seemed to be facilitating good responses in brain tumors. Uh, also going to apply here. So that's our second goal, okay? The, the issue with these agents is, well, while they target these uh, regulatory cells, they also target other cells, and that leaves the patient somewhat immunodeficient or with the inability to respond to things like pathogens. So you're kind of right back where you started. You might be treating the cancer, but now you, you get sick and die of some viral infection. Okay? So that's not a good approach. So now people are starting to put together these two goals and trying to find mechanisms to make this happen instead of taking one or the other. They're really focusing on both. And so the one I'm going to present now is the work that I've done. And so we created a molecule called an Ig chimera. Ig means immunoglobulin. Another common name for it is antibody. Okay. So this is what an antibody looks like. And we change this antibody structure by replacing a portion of it with a peptide. And here we're going to use a tumor peptide. Okay? Now I'm going to explain why you'd use this in just a minute. Here's the uh, structure, the one we're going to use in the study I'm going to briefly comment on. I used a protein called ovalbumin. 323-339 represents the peptide that I've inserted. So there's a peptide insert here. So this, when this antibody is made, it's going to have a small peptide inserted in this region. And that's going to be used to trigger the activation of a population of cells called CD4 T cells. Okay, so we talked about CD8. The difference is CD4 is the identifying protein on the cell surface. And it has different functions. It's called a helper cell, and that's exactly what it does. It helps everybody. You can kind of think of this guy as the general for the immune response. It kind of organizes the response, tells this guy to do this, this guy to do this, and helps this guy to do that. Okay? So what it does is it promotes killing by T cells, CD8 T cells, helps antibodies to be made by B cells. Again, it's slightly different from what we're using it for here. It helps the macrophages not to be M2 or IL-10 producing, but helps them to be more killer-like. And it promotes DC uh, presentation of antigens and maturation and all those things. So that all sounds really good. And so that's the idea behind this, is to hopefully facilitate a CD4 T cell response. And we're going to use the uh, wild type, that's what W stands for, as our control for all of our studies. So there's no insert. It's the wild type structure antibody. Okay. So how does this work? Well, there's a couple of nice features. Uh, that comes out of using this kind of structure. If we look at the, the Ig chimera, this bottom portion here, what I call the butt of the Y, it looks like a Y, right? And so the butt of the Y actually is called the FC region. And this FC region is bound by 
something called FC receptors, which you find highly expressed on dendritic cells. That's really nice. Once the Ig chimera binds the FC receptor, it does two things. First of all, it induces cell signaling that turns the yellow guy into the red guy. So now you have a mature APC, and it does it very well, okay? So now you have MHC molecules, you have the long extensions, and you have the ability to process antigen and present it very effectively. The other thing is, is that this whole unit gets taken in, traffic to a processing center, and then the little red peptide gets clipped out and placed on MHC molecule. So now you can present that antigen, which that's what I wanted in the first place. This is so effective that if you compare this to protein or peptide alone, it's about a thousand times more effective, more efficient. So very, I have the data for it, but we don't really have time for me to go through that, okay? The other nice thing is that when this Ig chimera binds the FC receptor, it triggers the liberation of IL-12, interleukin-12. And so this is a study, uh, sh purified dendritic cells. We put in a, a different concentration of Ig chimera, and you can see it liberates pretty sufficient amounts of IL-12. Now, why is that important? First of all, the IL-12 is going to prevent MDSC generation. So you're going to eliminate this population. You're going to reduce those numbers, and you're going to prevent any further ones. Wherever the DC is, you're going to su you're suppress this MDSC population. Secondly, when you're activating a T cell in the lymph node or spleen, this dendritic cell is producing that IL-12. That just so happens to trigger a gene called TBET in the T cell, which converts this T cell into something called TH1. Okay. That T cell now produces a cytokine called interferon gamma. Very important cytokine to be produced. And it produces it robustly. And so what we end up getting, an interferon gamma response is actually gonna stop the production of T regulatory cells as well. So now we have a dual mode action. We're able to suppress this guy as well as the T regs by one molecule, okay? So, did we get interferon gamma T cells being made? Here I took splenocytes, put them into a, a culture, added in dendritic cells and the Ig chimera, and you can see I got a really nice interferon gamma producing population of T cells. And we know it was T cells because the only thing we added was dendritic cells in our chimera. Couldn't have been anything else. Okay, so IL-12 induced the interferon gamma producing T cells. So this is what we hope to devise now once we put this system into the animal. Instead of having a suppressive environment, we want it dominated by 12 and interferon gamma. So you get this nice interferon gamma TH1 number of T cells in here. The macrophages become IL-12 producers and killers of tumor. You get plenty of mature DC so they can help to activate other things like CD8 T cells. Okay. Uh, and in essence, you lose the population of regulatory cells which has been suppressing uh, or keeping those tumors persistent for so long. So this is the hope. So does it work? So now we take it to the mouse model. So here we have a tumor that's expressing the ov ovipeptides injected into the animal. Wait for the tumor to form. Okay, so I had to palpate a nice tumor. And then I gave the animals in this particular study only one injection of the Ig chimera and then assessed tumor growth over a number of days. Here's the data. And so here, instead of doing tumor outgrowth because I had what seems to be cure, I did tumor-free mice. So you can see all groups, uh, all tumor-free, and then eventually tumor, it's palpated. They all become uh, loaded with tumor. Only the group that received the IgOVA returned back to being tumor-free, or they had complete regression of the tumor. Follow this out to about 70 days, uh, and they were still clear of tumor. Okay. So the question is now, did I actually get a TH1 response and did we reduce that immunosuppressive environment? So did a couple of things here. I took the animals from the study, roughly day 21 to 29. I, I bled some of the animals to collect serum so I could test for 10 and TGF beta and then collected the spleen from these three different groups. Uh, took the splenocytes from those spleen, added in the peptide. Splenocytes is going to have uh, all the different cells in there. It's T cells and DC. So all I need to do is add the peptide and look for a response. And so I'm going to look to see if they have interferon gamma in the cell culture. And so this is just making it short and sweet. T cell response interferon gamma, nice, robust with IgOVA. Not really that comparative between, most likely the effect here was from the chimera itself inducing some IL-12. 
Uh, and then IL-10 and TGF-beta, which would be kind of a proxy for the immunosuppressive environment that we'd find in lymph nodes, spleen, and then the tumor is significantly reduced as well, suggesting that we actually did what we hope to set out to do and accomplish those two goals of cancer immunotherapy. So you might be thinking, oh, that's great in the mice, but how is this applicable to human systems? The nice thing about the Chimera is that there's an enzyme cleavage that you can do. Simply remove the FC portion of mouse and replace it with the FC portion of humans, and now you can simply inject those in the patient. So what I'm hoping to be able to do, we could kind of actually, I thought about this while a lot of the talks are going on today, you could take some of the genomic data based on uh, all the different tumors, you could make a series, these antibodies take about a month to make, you could make a whole panel of these and then based on what patient's genomic data comes back with in terms of the antigens that's being expressed or those that's mutant that being overexpressed, you could simply use those and inject those in the patient uh, in a similar fashion for hopefully achievement of cancer immunotherapy. Okay. So I think uh, what we've done in the last few minutes is, is kind of talk about some of the advances that have been made both in humans and, and certainly in preclinical studies. And I believe the answer is, you know, tumor immunology I think has come uh, a long way in the sense that um, we now understand a little bit better uh, in terms of the pathogenesis and this interplay between cancer cells and the immune system. And that's helped us really devise therapies like this that's incorporated all that information that might lead us to some better successes in terms of pr promoting better quality of life as well as survival, maybe even uh, complete regression of tumors. And uh, that's what I have. So and these are the guys that helped me. I did a lot of this work while I was at UVA. I did some uh, at my previous institution and then carried it on here at VCOM. So that's it. So I'd like to invite our speakers to come up for our panel. There's an extra chair there for you if you'd like. And, sure. and uh, Dr. Sharma, if you want to pull a chair over, we need an extra chair, and I'll be glad to stand over here. We've entered the panel discussion phase, and I hope you guys have saved some good questions.